Hello all of you. So in the last lecture we have been discussing the idea of thermodynamic functions why they should be minimized at equilibrium. We discussed the case of multi component systems and discussed the idea of chemical potential. So in this lecture we will discuss an important relation called the Gibbs to Hem relation and then discuss about extensive and intensive variables and finally we conclude with something called Maxwell relations. So essentially what we have done so far is we have defined four thermodynamic functions the internal energy, the enthalpy, the Helmholtz free energy and the Gibbs free energy and then we have written the differential form of these in terms of different choice of control variables. For example, du is Tds minus Pdv plus sum over j mu j d and j, dh is Tds plus Vdp plus sum over j mu j d and j, df is minus s d t minus p d v plus sum over j mu j d and j and d g is minus s d t plus v d p plus sum over j mu j d and j. So, obviously what is different in this thermodynamic functions are the control variables. For example, u is a function of s, v and n, j. I use a curly bracket because we have different number of molecules of different components. Similarly, h is a function of s, p and number of molecules. F is a function of T, V and number of molecules and G is a function of T, P and number of molecules. And the way to get these functions if you recall was from the Legendre transformation we converted U to H by replacing V as a control variable to P and similarly we have done for other free energies and so on. However, you must have noticed one thing in which all these functions I have still kept the last term as the same. So, chemical potential we have defined as the change in energy per unit mole or the change in energy by adding a, a molecule in the system. So, we can define on a molecular basis or we can define per mole. But the key point is that this chemical potential always is the partial derivative of whatever energy that we have defined. So, in the case of u it is dou u by dou nj and of course the partial derivative is for constant s, constant v and constant number of all the species except j. I can write the same thing as in terms of the enthalpy, but now we have constant S, constant P, constant K not equal to J and I can write as in the same form in term of F as dou F by dou N J now at constant T, constant V and constant N K not equal to J. And in this case we can write as dou g by dou n j constant t constant p constant n k not equal to j. You may imagine that why are we not doing a transformation of variable in the last term? Why we cannot have a function which is basically something like this?
and for that function let us give it some name let, let me call that function some d of x. Can't we define a function like this for which the controlling variable are t, p and mu j and the answer is we cannot and that is where the idea of extensive and intensive variable comes into picture. So, what you may have noticed here is that we had formed three pairs of variables which we call conjugate variables. So, T s is a conjugate variable, P v is a conjugate variable and the mu j's and the n j's are the conjugate variable. However, there is something interesting about these particular pairs that we have. In all these pairs, one of the variables is not changed if I change the amount of the substance or if I change the size of the system and the other variable does change. Let us say for example, temperature. If for example, I have a glass of water at 30 degrees Celsius, if I look at half of the glass, the temperature remains the same. The same is not true for entropy. We have already discussed that entropy increases as the number of molecules increases. So, entropy depends on the number of molecules or the size of system under consideration, but temperature does not. Similarly, pressure. When we have a system at 1 bar pressure, it does not matter whether we have 1 liter of that or 10 liters of that. The pressure is independent of the quantity. Similarly, the chemical potential, it is a change in energy by adding one molecule. So, even if we have 10,000 molecules, since we have defined chemical potential as per molecule, it is going to be independent of the system size. Of course, chemical potential may depend on composition, but it will not depend on the system size itself. For same composition, for a larger system versus a smaller system, we will have the same chemical potential. However, number of molecules clearly will change when we change the system size. The volume will clearly change when we change the system size or the number of molecules. The entropy as I said will clearly change if I change the number of molecules or the system size. So, all these three variables are therefore called extensive variables. And when I call something extensive, it means that it depends on the quantity of the substance. So, now if I go back to our previous slide, what you notice is that in all these cases of thermodynamic functions, we have always kept at least one extensive variable as the control variable. In the first case, when we had u, all these three entropy, volume and the number of molecules, all of them are extensive. When we did the transformation h, p is no longer extensive, but s and n j are still extensive. When we did transformation f, temperature is not extensive anymore, but the volume and the number of molecules still is. And when we did for g, number of molecules are the only extensive variable, actually number of molecule for every species. So, we have almost n1, n2 to the number of components we have, all of these are extensive variables. So, what happens if I choose only the T, P and mu j for this function I was telling you. For this case, all the control variables become intensive variables. So, this means this x is going to be a function of temperature, pressure and the chemical potentials and of course, we have so many chemical potentials for every component. Now, if I do that, so now I, I was telling you that control variables are the one we are controlling. So, in some sense 
we are representing the system in terms of those control variables. So, if for example, I do not include any extensive variable as a control variable, what this means is that we have nothing that characterizes the system size as the control variable. So, our system description is in some sense incomplete because if I specify the temperature, pressure and the chemical potential, we are not specifying the system size. If we, are, we specify temperature, pressure and the number of molecules, the number of molecules contained the description of the system size. But now when we are doing temperature, pressure and chemical potential, that description has been lost. So, therefore, the, the argument we are trying to make is there must be at least one variable in the control variable that should be extensive and if it is not happening, we will not have a thermodynamic function. So, therefore, x is not a thermodynamic function. And in fact, the particular relation that we have just written that must be equal to 0 and this relation is known as the Gibbs Duhem relation. There are several ways to derive this, but it will suffice to say that once we have all the extensive variables, all the intensive variables as the control variables, that thermodynamic functions is not defined. And for that case, a differential form we get should be equal to 0 and that is the Gibbs-Tohem relation, right. That is one way to uh, look at this. There are other ways to also prove the same argument. So, now using the Gibbs-Tohem relation, we can now get something else and that is the following. So, now since we know that minus S d t plus V d p plus sum over j n j d mu j, this is equal to 0, that is the relation we have. And now, if I start with the expression for d u we had, I can now add this entire expression on the right hand side here because that is anyway equal to 0. So, this I can write as something like this. You have to be slightly careful here, actually this should have been a minus sign. So, what essentially we are adding is this multiplied by a minus sign here and this should have been a minus sign that is what should have appeared in the in the Gibbs uh, Duhem equation. So, let me correct this. And you can see why this happens because when we went from du to df, the TDS was replaced by minus SDT. When we went from du to dh, minus PDV was replaced by plus VDP. So, there is a sign change in the transformation. So, when we go from mu j d n j to n j d mu j, we should have a minus sign in that particular expression. So, keep, keep in mind that in Gibbs to him re relation there is a minus sign in front of n j d mu j. So, with this kind of an idea, what you can see now is that this becomes a derivative of T s and this becomes a derivative of P v 
and this becomes a derivative of mu j multiplied by n j. So, therefore, I can write my du as d of t s plus d of minus p v plus d of sum over j mu j n j and that is my d u is equal to d of t s minus p v plus sum over j mu j n j and that is I can write now my u as T s minus P v plus sum over j mu j n j. So, if I go back to our previous expression, we have not had an expression for u, we had an expression for d u. But using the Gibbs to him relation, we have been able to find an expression for absolute value of u right and that expression is given by the expression right here and you can see it clearly demonstrate that my energy is composed of basically three kinds of energy and let me give them some names. The first relates to temperature so let me call this thermal energy The second relates to the pressure volume work. So, let me call it the mechanical energy thinking of a piston that is trying to do a work when the volume is changed. And then finally, the last one relates to components being added or removed. So, we call this the chemical energy. Using now the definition of u, we can find the value of other thermodynamic functions. For example, h is going to be equal to u plus p v that is T s plus sum over j mu j n j. Similarly, f is going to be u minus T s that is equal to minus p v plus sum over j mu j n j and finally, g is equal to h minus t s that is equal to sum over j mu j n j. Okay. So, what this tells me is that indeed chemical potential and the Gibbs energy are very closely related. If I multiply the chemical potential with the number of molecules and sum it over all the components, we get the Gibbs free energy. So, when we define the chemical potential as the partial molar Gibbs energy, we are not wrong in doing that. But when we look in the differential expressions, then we have to keep in mind that the chemical potential is also a partial derivative of other energy functions. Actually, whatever energy function or thermodynamic function is appropriate given the control variable should be used for the description of chemical potential. Right? So, this should be like very clear on our minds that although the chemical potential has a close relation with the Gibbs energy that does not mean that we have to always use the Gibbs energy. All it means is that we have to first look at which variable is being controlled in the particular problem. So, using these ideas, uh, we can now define I would say more rigorously why exactly we get that. And to do that, we first discuss the idea of homogeneous functions. The thermodynamic functions are examples of a homogeneous functions. And on these functions, there is a theorem called the Euler theorem. And if I use the Euler theorem, I basically get the same result that I have got using the Gibbs to him relation. So, the homogeneous function is defined in the following way. Let us say for example, a function of variable x 1, x 2 to some variable x n 
is such that if I multiply every variable with lambda, we get lambda to the power n multiplied with the function value x1, x2 to xn. Right? This is what we call a homogeneous function. Let us take an example. Let us say we have f of x y is equal to x y. Now, let us say if I am doing f of lambda x lambda y, what is it equal to? It is equal to lambda x multiplied with lambda y that is lambda square x y that is lambda square f of x y. So, in this case n is equal to 2 and n is the order of the homogeneous function. right? So, this is a homogeneous function of order, order 2. If we have some other function, it may have a lower order. Let us say for example, we have f x y is equal to x plus y. In this case, f of lambda x lambda y is going to be lambda x plus lambda y and that is simply lambda multiplied with function of x y. So, now in this case, we have an order 1 homogeneous function. In the other case, we had order 2 homogeneous function. We can think of functions which are not homogeneous. Let us say for example, if we had f of x y as x y plus 3. Now, in this case f of lambda x lambda y is equal to lambda square x y plus 3. This is not equal to lambda square multiplied with function of x and y because if I do that, the constant term will be 3 lambda square not equal to 3. right? So, only some functions are homogeneous, not all the functions are homogeneous. However, the functions that we are interested in are all homogeneous function, but we will come to that in a minute. Let us first discuss the property of homogeneous functions called the Euler theorem. So, if I start with this particular relation, So, if I go back to the expression we had for the Euler theorem, we had this. Now, if I take a derivative of this function with respect to lambda, what do we have is because f of x1 to xn is not a function of lambda. So, if I now want to take a derivative with respect to lambda on the left hand side, what you notice is that I want to first take a derivative with respect to the first argument. So, the way to do that is we do something like this. And then I can do the same thing for the second argument. and so on. So, what do we get from here is we get x 1 dou f by dou lambda x 1 
plus x2 dou f by dou lambda x2 plus until x n dou f by dou lambda x n. So, now if I set the value of lambda is equal to 1, what we get is the statement of the Euler theorem that says that n f x 1 to x n is equal to x 1 dou f by dou x 1 plus x 2 dou f by dou x 2 and so on. Okay. So, this is what establishes the, the Euler theorem. We start with the description of the homogeneous function and then take a derivative with respect to lambda on both sides and then finally set lambda equal to 1 and we get the relation for the Euler theorem. So, now let us see how it is applied in practice. Let us say for example, if I am interested in my Gibbs free energy. So, my Gibbs free energy is in terms of temperature, pressure and number of molecules. Now, clearly temperature and pressure are intensive variable, but the number of molecules is not. So, in this case, I cannot simply multiply temperature with lambda or pressure with lambda, it does not have any meaning, but we can multiply nj with lambda and if I do that, my system becomes lambda times. So, if my system becomes lambda times, my energy should also become lambda times. So, let us say for example, if I am working at a constant temperature and pressure because clearly multiplying temperature and pressure by lambda times does not make any sense. What we have is that G of temperature pressure lambda multiplied with n j is equal to lambda G temperature pressure n j. So, therefore, the Gibbs free energy is a homogeneous function of order 1. Now, even if I am doing some other thermodynamic function that is still is a homogeneous function of order 1 and why is that? Let us say for example, if I look at my internal energy. So, now we have S, V and N, J. Now, if I multiply all of them with lambda, what do we have? We have energy of a system of entropy lambda s of volume lambda v and of number of molecules lambda n j. So, clearly if I make my number of molecules lambda times entropy automatically becomes lambda time, volume automatically become lambda time and the energy should also become lambda times, it should not be lambda square times. right? So, when we increase the system size, energy increases in proportion to the system size. So, this is also lambda u s v n j. So, even in the, even for this case when we did not have only one extensive variable as the control variable, even in that case the homogeneous function is still of order 1. So, all thermodynamic functions therefore, is a homogeneous function of order 1. So, if I use that argument for the first function that we started with and I use Euler theorem, what do we notice is that my n that refers to the order that is equal to 1. So, we have G for temperature, pressure and n j should be equal to my x 1 dou f by x 1, what is x 1? x 1 is a variable and in this case the variable is the number of molecules which are being multiplied with lambda. So, in this case we what we have is n 1 dou g by dou n 1 plus n 2 dou g by dou n 2 
and so on. So, therefore, we can write this as sum over n j dou g by dou n j and we know what dou g by dou n j is and that is equal to my chemical potential. So, what we establish is that the Gibbs free energy is equal to chemical potential multiplied by the number of molecule summed over all the species in the in the system which is the same result that I have obtained when using the Gibbs to hem relation. So, finally, before I before I conclude I briefly discuss the idea of uh, Maxwell relations although this has been elaborated in the previous thermodynamics class that you may have had uh, it can be easily derived from what where we had discussed. So, the Maxwell relations are based on the idea that if for example, if I start with any of the differential forms that I wrote and I compute the first partial derivative what we have is dou u by dou s at constant volume and the number of molecules is equal to temperature and dou u by dou v at constant entropy and the number of molecule is equal to minus p. And now, once I have found the first derivative, I can take a second derivative with respect to the other variable. And when I take a second derivative, there are two possibilities. We can take either a dou by dou v of this or I can do a dou by dou s of this. So, you have a second derivative of u either in the order that we first take derivative with respect to s then with v or we do opposite of that and the argument over which the Maxwell relation builds is both of these has to be the same. There is some math that goes behind it, but we are not getting in there. The key point is if I take the derivative in any order for the second derivative we will get the same result. So, what we get from here is if I take a derivative with respect to v we have dou t by dou v and we have dou p by dou s here. So, therefore, what we find is dou t by dou v is equal to minus dou p by dou s here. We have to be slightly careful about what is being held fixed there. So, we already have held the volume fixed in the first derivative with s. But when we take derivative with respect to volume, we should take the other guys fixed. So, when we are doing the second derivative, what is being held fixed is the entropy and the number of moles. In the second case, we are taking a derivative with respect to s, the second derivative. The first derivative does not matter here. The second derivative is with respect to s and therefore, we should keep the volume and number of moles constant. And just like what we have done here for u, we can get the same result for other thermodynamic functions. Let us say for example, we have d h as t d s plus v d p plus sum over j mu j d and j and let us say I do the same exercise for this case we can find dou h by dou s at constant p and n j that is equal to my t dou h by dou p at constant s and number of molecules is equal to v. Now, if I take a second derivative the first time I will take with pressure that is the second variable here. So, what we have is dou t by dou p and now since we are doing with respect to p the variable that is constant is s and n j and in this case we do with respect to my s. So, what we have is dou v by dou s and the variable that is constant is p and n j and therefore, 
these two should be the same. So, we should have dou t by dou p s and j is equal to dou v by dou s p and j. And we can do it for all combinations of variables for all thermodynamic functions. So, in total we will have so many Maxwell relations. Now, the key advantage of Maxwell relations is the following. If for example, I know the pressure volume temperature relation for any system and this I can get from experiments. Let us say for the case of an ideal gas, we know PV equal to nRT. If it is some other system, we may have to do experiments and find that. Now, once we have found that, then using that PVT relation or the equation of state, that is what it is called, we can find the thermodynamic functions by the use of the Maxwell relations, right. So, in this lecture, I have basically demonstrated few concepts. The first was the idea of Gibbs to Hem relation, that is, we cannot have only the intensive variable as controlling variables. Then we discussed the idea of homogeneous functions. We established the, well, the relations for absolute values of thermodynamic functions. And finally, we discussed the idea of Maxwell relations and I touched it very briefly because this is something that you must have done in your undergrad thermodynamics. So, with that I conclude here. Thank you.